The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Greetings and uh, welcome to another part of our series, uh, part of a 10-part webinar series sponsored by the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals and the Regional Centers for Workforce Transformation, funded by New York State Office for People with Developmental Disabilities. This is a, a series of webinars on the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals Code of Ethics. Uh, I'm very pleased to be filling in. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, one of our NADSP faculty was unable to uh, be with us today to record this and to be live with us. So I am filling in for uh, Kathy Brown, um, which you'll see her later on in our webinar series or somewhere down the road. But for now, you got me. Uh, my name is uh, John Raphael. Um, I'll introduce myself in just a second. What we're doing with these series of webinars, um, we felt as though we needed to focus on the code of ethics uh, that has been created by the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals, uh, which has been adopted, you know, in New York State for direct support professionals to, to abide by. Um, and we wanted to make a series of webinars in collaboration with the regional centers for workforce transformation. And we wanted to make them kind of accessible, if you will. And we wanted to make them short. So uh, these are going to be not your typical hour-long webinars with lots of graphs and charts and such. These are short webinars that last about 20 minutes, and have we have some time at the end uh, for some questions and answers. Um, but also, all of these recordings and all of these webinars will be available on the Regional Centers for Workforce Transformation website, as well as the members-only section on our website at the National Alliance for the Rec Support Professionals. So with that in mind, um, just this is what to expect. So it's going to be a, a, a very informative, quick webinar. My name is John Raphael. I am the Director of Educational Services for the National Alliance for the Rec Support Professionals and have a pretty extensive background in working with uh, people with disabilities and more so working as a direct support professional and working with direct support professionals. Um, I'm very happy to be presenting on this particular topic because it's near and dear to my heart, uh, partly because I'm a Libra, uh, and I'll explain what that means in a little bit, but uh, the other reason is because I believe that justice, fairness, and equity is an area where direct support professionals um, encounter ethical dilemmas and ethical situations all the time. And that's what this webinar is devoted to, is the tenet of justice, fairness, and equity in the NADSP Code of Ethics. Our Code of Ethics is divided into nine tenets, nine sections, if you will. It's a very short uh, uh, narrative document. It's on just over 2,000 words. And um, what we're going to focus on today is justice, fairness, and equity. Um, I think it's really important to for everybody that's listening to this and for anybody that, if they're new to uh, learning about the National Alliance for the Rec Support Professionals Code of Ethics, um, I think it's really important for you to, uh, you can you can take it off the website, um, you go to nadsp.org and you can find the entire narrative of the Code of Ethics and certainly I recommend you do that. Um, but the preamble to our Code of Ethics is important to read. I read it, I literally, I read it every week to remind myself how important it is to, to be ethical in the practice of direct support. Um, and in our Code of Ethics, we, we have a bit of a challenge. You know, and I, We kind of call it that, the, the NADSP Code of Ethics Challenge, because what I think often direct support professionals are looking for answers to situations that there really are no answers. Um, especially when you're supporting people, human beings um, in general. But then when you add to that human beings that, that happen to have a disability, it becomes very complicated at times, and it can be very tricky at times. Um, and that said, the code of ethics is meant to be a roadmap. It's a roadmap to assist us in staying the course of securing freedom, justice, and equality for all. And what's very interesting, that's directly from the preamble, and that's interesting because that is exactly what this tenet is about. So, justice, fairness, and equity. As a direct support professional, I will affirm the human rights as well as the civil rights and responsibilities of the people I support. I will promote and practice justice, fairness, and equity for the people I support and the community as a whole. 
Uh, now you see the, the 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 scales of justice, and justice is blind right there. You see, which is very interesting uh, when you think about uh, disability, and you know one form of disability as being a visual impairment or or blindness. Uh, there's a reason that justice is blind. Um, justice is about is about making things equal and making things right. Um, but it's interesting, justice often is in response to something that may be hurtful or may be something that has done harm in some way, whether it's physical harm, psychological harm, financial harm, whatever it might be. But justice, and when you add fairness and equity into the picture, um, justice is something that all of us obviously uh, uh, contend with or 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 deal with on a daily basis. When direct support professionals deal with it in the context of supporting people with disabilities, developmental disabilities particularly, there's often lots of, of aspects of justice, fairness, and equity that that they face um, in, in the partnership that they have with the people that they support. And some of these considerations I would just like to put out there for you to kind of think about. I'm not going to go deeply into of the, these these areas of justice and fairness and equity in our society, but I think and one of the purposes of our webinars is to yeah watch this webinar or listen to this webinar, but take this webinar and then use this 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 information for discussions back home, discussions back at the workplace, discussions with your your colleagues, with your supervisors, uh, discussions certainly with the people you support and the family members of the people you support. Because these discussions are ultimately what matters. Because I think that these discussions, when you have them based on something like the Code of Ethics, they can really lead to a greater understanding and a greater, I believe, a greater sense of, of professional practice and, and, and good outcomes with people with disabilities. So some considerations when it comes to um, the celebrating the human rights, the civil rights, and promoting the human rights and civil rights of people with disabilities as a direct support professional. Some of these things include voting. Um, it's very interesting. We This happens to be, this recording is happen, happening around a recent election day. Um, and uh, I, I hope that a lot of people uh, with disabilities uh, went out and, and voted. Um, and it's often people with disabilities uh, that get supported in their voting, their right to vote, uh, via direct support professionals. Uh, I've worked with many direct support professionals over the years that have assisted people in registering to vote, um, but also taken people to uh, uh, the polling place to where they would cast their ballot, where, in fact, uh, the next piece you see there, discrimination, there have been several times when I've had to uh, get involved with numerous people in a team where people were not given uh, uh, the right to vote. Uh, they were turned away um, at, at a polling place. Um, and that's obviously discrimination. That's against the law. Um, but it was based on the fact that uh, the, and this was several years ago, this wasn't recently, but nonetheless, this, is, this was an exact uh, uh, situation where a direct support professional was engaged in a situation where discrimination was taking place in and around voting. Um, and the reason the person wasn't allowed to vote is because they didn't, couldn't have access. They, it was hard to get them access into the polling place. So that said, that again, that was many years ago. That was remedied. And, but those things still happen to this day. Uh, exploitation is a very important thing to consider when it comes to supporting people with developmental disabilities, whether it's the kinds of exploitation that can occur uh, in the context of living, you know, in some kind of congregate setting and some kind of, you know, in an agency or a provider organization, um, financial exploitation uh, that can happen anywhere. Uh, but we hear about that often, you know, maybe family members that you're in, involved in a situation as a maybe a community habilitation direct support professional, or in other words, a, a direct support professional that works directly in a family setting. And you might see financial exploitation taking place with a person that's supported, whether it's some kind of uh, income that uh, the person is receiving that's being taken by a, a family member or a community member or whatever. These are the things that direct support professionals might see, and they're going to have to absolutely consider it. And, and, 
and confront these situations. Um, sexual exploitation, unfortunately, uh, is is a very common uh, occurrence among people with disabilities. And uh, again, we're not going to take a lot of time to go into the statistics. We ha- we could we could have uh, webinars on each of these areas, uh, but I'm just giving you a general framework of how important justice, fairness, and equity is to consider in the lives of people with disabilities. Sexual orientation, it's something that more and more in our society, certainly in the United States, we are finding more and more issues in and around acceptance of sexual orientation and uh, and, and and the like. But that's something that, to, that we do and must consider that people with disabilities that we support, they have a right to, to experience their own and have their own sexual orientation and not be uh, discriminated against it. Safety, um, health care, the list goes on. These are all rights, um, and they all have varying degrees of of, uh, of of aspects where direct support professionals might be involved in 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 intervening or getting help with intervening in a situation where any of these things might be at risk. This is the second statement uh, in and around the direct support professionals justice fairness and equity obligation as a direct support professional i will assist the people i support to access opportunities and resources of the community that are available to everyone and i I found this cartoon it's really a great cartoon um because what it is um it's actually a series of cartoons and i didn't have enough space and i didn't you know have enough time to really make it like i wanted to make it um but this is a a, a carl's cafe and as you can see carl um the fellow there that that might be i guess that's carl welcome come on in and um and he's got the ramp not only he's got the ramp and that's important and the person that is he's inviting in happens to be using a wheelchair and he's saying, thanks, I could use a coffee, uh, the gentleman in a wheelchair. Um, what I like about this is just Carl's body language. His arms are open. He's smiling. Um, and I think that's vital. Uh, the ramp is certainly vital. <laughs> and, you know, it was it was not that long ago, 20, 27 years ago, um, that the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed. That's that's very that's very recent history, and as you probably know, the Americans with Disabilities Act was all about helping people with disabilities access their world, access their community. Um, but as we see still today, that becomes often a struggle, and direct support professionals wind up being in the middle of that struggle sometimes. And we must guide them with a code of ethics that assists them with helping people access opportunities and resources to the, in the community, in and of the community. And I, I, I think of two things when I think of access. There's physical access, without a doubt, you know, whether that's uh, um, curb cuts and, and ramps and, and parking and, and all that kind of stuff. That's important. Um, we see more and more of that, and we see it better uh, as time goes on, thank goodness. But I'm more concerned about social access when it comes to direct support professionals. Social access is all about helping people integrate, truly integrate, and become included in the community. And that access, I find harder to engage and harder to foster. for various reasons, and I think some of those reasons deal with discrimination in our communities still, uh, the misperception about people with disabilities, whether they be physical disabilities, intellectual disabilities, or otherwise. But I think social access is where direct support professionals, they can really shine. They can absolutely, um, do, and I've seen it time and again, they can do the proverbial quote-unquote handshake. They can be the gatekeeper in situations where otherwise I think people with disabilities would not necessarily get that access. And an example would be, I worked at an organization uh, at one point, and uh, in this particular town where this organization had um, uh, people being supported, there was a little coffee house, and the coffee house had a... um, a, uh, 
uh, open mic, as it's called, where people, anybody could come up and sign up and sing and play guitar and do whatever for, you know, uh, for a song or two. Um, there was a direct support professional that worked with a woman who had, uh, had autism and who was extremely shy, but loved to sing and always wanted to sing in front of people. And a very long story, uh, a beautiful long story made short. This direct support professional over the course of probably three or four months brought this young woman to the coffee house, uh, introduced her to people very gently and gradually, uh, showed her over the course of a few weeks, you know, what open mic night was. And then eventually, uh, one night, uh, she mustered up the courage along with his encouragement to sing a song and go up there on the stage, sing a song accompanied by him on the guitar, by the way. Um, and it was a success and she became a regular at the, at this open mic night. So that's social access. And I think that is a right. I think that is about justice, fairness, and equity. And I believe that's where direct support professionals can absolutely uh, uh, become champions. And, and I've seen it happen. It's a beautiful thing to see. Um, as a direct support professional, I will facilitate the expression and understanding of one's rights and responsibilities with the people I support. Um, I love this uh, beautiful cartoon. It's a, it's, it doesn't say much, but it says everything, that we're equal. And it comes from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, my goodness, from 1948, all human beings are born free and equal. And although that sounds, you know, obvious, that doesn't come easy for many people with disabilities. Facil facilitation with people is what direct support professionals need to do more of. Um, oftentimes we hear, I advocate for people. I'm a direct support professional. I advocate for Jim. I advocate for Karen. And no, we don't want, people with disabilities don't want advocating for, they want advocating with and facilitation with them in and around situations where they might need access to something or exposure to something or assistance with not being discriminated against or, or whatever it might be, anything dealing with what we've just talked about. So that's very important when we look at what a direct support professional must do. They must do it with that person and be somebody that will be in partnership and equity. That's where the word equity comes in, in my opinion. Equity is about being equal, not being a, a professional, quote unquote, but being equal in a role in a position where you can absolutely foster and facilitate some kind of positive outcome that creates justice, fairness, and equity for that person you're supporting. The last piece of this, of this particular code is as a direct support professional, I will understand the guardianship or other legal representation of the people I support and work in partnership with legal representatives to assure that persons that the person's preferences and interests are honored. This is controversial. This is complicated. Um, this can be a very tricky uh, area for direct support professionals to navigate. But that said, I think it's very important that we never forget that even if a person has a guardian, um, we must understand that that's still an individual that we have to have allegiance to. Our first allegiance is to the person that we support. That's being person-centered. That's part of our ethics. And our first allegiance is to the person we support. That doesn't mean we, don't, you know, we disregard a guardian or disrespect a guardian or parent or a loved one. No. But what we must do is we must understand the aspects and components that go along with guardianship. Um, I use this as a real, uh, It's it, in my opinion, it's a very important thing to to, to show direct support professionals when we teach them about decision making, informed decision making, and supported decision making, and this is this applies whether somebody has a guardian or not. And take a look. This comes from uh, Inclusion International, their 2014 report, uh, which was a global report on the right to decide. Inclusion International, you know, check them out. Google Inclusion International. It's basically an international self advocacy organization who strive to give the world reports on what's going on in the lives of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities globally. 
And this is what they wrote in 2014. It's very sobering. So take a look. When people are supported to make decisions for themselves, they're seen as more capable by others. Doesn't that sound so obvious? But this is what self-advocates from around the globe report. When we're not allowed to make our own decisions, or when someone else makes our decisions for us, we're seen as less capable and having less value in the community. That is sobering because that, my friends who are listening, that is where we, I think we do struggle with this com- this idea of, of guardianship. And when we see that uh, guardians have legal obligations, and we absolutely have to, we have to honor those legal obligations and 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 uh, restrictions that might come in play when when it comes to people making decisions. We also must um, respect that people do have components of their personhood where they can make individual choices. And that again, that could that could take a whole webinar. We teach we teach that in our informed decision making curriculum. But I think that's important to keep in mind when we when we do consider this aspect of justice, fairness, and equity in terms of the code of ethics tenet. Um, I think we are now um, ready for some questions and answers. So uh, I don't know Tanya if we have any that are are. Uh, in in the queue, do we have any there, Tanya? I don't see any on the webcam or on the on the on the question box. John, we do not have any thus far. We don't. Do you have any? Uh, if, I don't know if you listen. Do you have any uh, any kind of inquiries or comments about uh, what we just talked about? Nope. Okay. Oh, hold on one second. I'm sorry. I'm uh, pulling up questions. All right. Here comes a question. Good, good, good. We need music. We need some like theme music or something, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> We're coming in. We were getting a lot of great feedback on people that are um, just enjoying it. Um, oh, good, 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 good. Um, we can go another three hours. I'm ready, but I don't think we can do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's one. We are so often generous to the people we support, but we also need to teach them to be generous and ways to give back in their community community so that they can be included as well. I think that's that's a very good comment. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah. I think. And um, John, here's a really good question. Okay. How would you help to advocate with someone who um, is nonverbal? Um, oh, that's an excellent question. And, you know, I get it all the time and I, you know, I struggle with it all the time. Um, I think there, I think there's two aspects to that quest, to that to this answer. I guess one, I think most direct support professionals, um, they know the people they support, regardless of their ability to use words or or not. But people that uh, don't use words to communicate, we always have to keep in mind people communicate. Um, always, always, always. There's no n- non communication. Um, Exactly. You know, um, so I think with that said, when you when you work with somebody and when you get to know them, somebody that doesn't use words, somebody that might have really significant disabilities, there are elements of that person that you'll there your assessment and your discovery with that person. You're going to you're going to be able to kind of translate. You're going to be able to, I think, in, in many situations understand enough about that person to probably speak and and i'm hesitant to say on behalf of this person but that's kind of what it is but your ethical obligation is to do your best to to know that person and the second aspect of this is to know that person is if if this person does have family and friends and loved ones and that kind of thing is to to find out from them and in and around them, the history of this person, if it's, if this is person is new to you or relatively new, that's our obligation. We'll never, ever, ever be able to, I mean, even if somebody does use words to speak and is a great communicator verbally, um, trust me, there's many ways in which we can still not understand what the heck that person is wanting. Um, you know, I, I think that's important that we don't see communication as only 
in the form of uh, words, as we, I think, in our field, we we know that we we support a lot of people that have other forms of communication. So I think, in terms of advocacy, in terms of facilitation, and sometimes there's downright situations where yes, you are going to intervene on behalf of somebody if there's a situation of clear discrimination, a situation that's clearly exploitive. You're going to intervene. You know, a situation that's abusive. Yes, you're going to intervene. Probably. Um, at the border of non-consent, you know, because you want to protect somebody. Hopefully those situations are few and far between. But generally, if it's a situation of advocacy with somebody that doesn't use words to speak, I would argue that most DSPs, a really good direct support professional, they're going to have a sense of where that person's where that person's choices and preferred outcomes are. That's how I would answer that question. I think that's great, John. And actually, that leads us to really two follow-up questions or two ways to take that the start of that conversation. One is, um, do you have any suggestions for providing um, family members or guardians um, uh, on ways of supporting people with disabilities regarding sexuality and, and their rights? Oh, goodness. it's That's a, that's a loaded question question um and i think i i hear you um i would need about three or four hours i would need about four or five other people uh, to help me but i think i I don't want to discount that question because i think it's so vital i think that again there's a couple i think a couple levels to that question or that inquiry or, or 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 whatever you want to call it i think as a family member and i know myself as a parent when it comes to the sexuality of my family members, um, it, it that that's a weird place. Generally, it's a very difficult place to navigate. Um, certainly, as a parent, um, but I think when we have uh, a, a loved one with a disability that might have um, uh, challenges in understanding sexuality, or maybe there's a, a sexual orientation question that's taking place, these kind of situations. What I would advise is. Um, you want to always reach out and find some expertise, whatever that expertise is. Um, uh, and I think there's a, as we learn more about human sexuality, as time goes on, as we w- learn more about human sexuality and people with disabilities, um, we, I think we have an obligation to make sure, and it's as hard as it might be, that that loved one of ours is an independent, autonomous human being that's a sexual human being. I know that's hard to hear, but every human being, they have a sexuality, and we can't deny that. Um, and I think what we have to do is make sure that when we are uh, in the process of helping that person discover their sexuality, which is a very difficult thing to do uh, as, a, as a family member, uh, I think we, we do have to kind of leave some of that stuff at the door and do our best to maybe – we might have to find somebody else to help. Uh, our loved one explore their sexuality. And I know that might be very hard. We have religious uh, aspects to sex- sexuality that come into play, cultural, um, uh, all kinds of things that, that are in and around that unfortunate taboo s- subject. Um, I know that our friend Dave Hingsberger, who uh, he spent, spends a lot of his time, his professional time, uh, exploring that specific subject. So I would also have people reach out to... Um, to, to Dave Hingsberger, um, you can reach him via me if you if you uh, would like. I'm happy to connect you to him. He's, he's ten, he, he would be one of the experts in this field, and there are many more. Uh, but and, and John, it also bears mentioning that we have done a webinar um, earlier this year on uh, our Let's Talk platform for NADSP members on um, exploring sexuality. Um, for people with disabilities um, who are um, gay, transsexual, bisexual, and transgender. Yep, yep, that's right. That's an, that's an, that's a, it was a powerful webinar, and that's in our archive, that's for sure. Um, so that's great, Tanya, you're right. Um, so yeah, I think good luck whoever asked that question. I think it's a, it, it, it's a place that's an, it's an ongoing process also. I think that's also the word I would use. It's a process that you that you do with your loved one. Um, so I don't, I, hopefully that has helped and not made, made it more confusing for you. Any more questions? Sonny? 
Actually, that one question spurred a lot of comments and a lot of questions, but there is one really great question that I think is a great closing question. Okay. Um, do, you have, do you have suggestions about how DSPs and other clinical team members can begin to approach um, sensitive topics of encouraging a guardian to afford the person to have more, quote unquote, say in his or her life? Oh. So not just um, you know, about sexuality, but just the overall topic of being able, um, you know, approaching a family member or a guardian um, yeah. about respect, you know, um, encouraging uh, more self-choice. Yes, I do. And it's something that I refer to constantly. Um, it's a very difficult thing to broach with a, with a guardian. Um, what we, and again, whatever the issue is, in fact, I just heard of a situation, um, uh, where a guardian wasn't happy with the kind of music that, um, the person was listening to that they, you know, they have guardianship over and, um, the DSP was really, they didn't know what to do about that. Um, so th yeah, that, that's a, that's a, an area that is, it's, 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 it's very complicated again. I mean, these are these are these are messy areas, so to speak. But here's what I would suggest, and I referred to it earlier in the webinar. It it would help to to read or to look at or to review the 2014 Inclusion International Global Report on the Right to Decide. And that's all you got to do is you can Google that. Um, if you want to touch you touch base with me via email, you can do that too. I can give you the link to it. But it's you know it's public access. But the global report on the right to decide, it is loaded with uh, all types of and it's hundred and fifty, hundred and sixty, maybe more pages. And what it is, it's written from the perspective of people with disabilities and, and their family members to a degree. And it, it deals with some of these things that family members may or may not, you know, have to contend with when it comes to people's right to decide on things, whether they're a, have a, whether somebody has a guardian or not, um, they, they have a right to decide certain things in their life. They have their own personhood, their own autonomy, um, their equality. But as we do know, guardianship does take some of that, power and some rights away that's the reality but to answer the question how to broach certain topics with family members i think it's helping those family members understand a little bit more about their family member and by that if you read this report you'll see it, it puts names and faces to these situations um, where you might have to help a, a family member um, see that their loved one can wear a certain kind of pants, you know, can listen to a certain kind of music. Um, and I, that, that would be my first suggestion. Um, but my, my, my second point, and I'll close with this, is that always be honest with family members. Always be respectful uh, and, and guardians. Always be upfront. I mean, short of neglect and abuse and that kind of thing, of course. But um, be honest lay it out what you believe, what your opinion is in terms of the life of the person that you're supporting. And always keep in mind the culture and, and frame of reference that that guardian comes from. But sometimes it's just a slow process of, 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 of a guardian letting go or a family member letting go um, or understanding. And that's where a direct support professional or a clinical person can really come in and, and help people learn. Um, that would be the best answer I could give you, but tread lightly and and tread respectfully, and I think you'll be okay. So I think with that said, um, thank you so much for uh, hanging out with us for this installment of um, the Code of Ethics, the NADSP Code of Ethics, uh, sponsored by NADSP and the Regional Centers for Workforce Transformation from New York State OPWDD. My name is John Raphael. Um, I wish you all a good day and, uh, and thank you very much.